and our officials and our agencies. Recording in progress. The chairperson of the board, Boot Martin and his team, you're warmly welcome. The purpose of the meeting is to get briefing on the 2022-23 strategic plan annual and annual performance plan and budget plan of of CIFA, which call which is called small enterprise finance agency. We um yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, ma'am. Um the purpose of the meeting, um, I don't know if I can speak now. But yes. Yes. I don't you know, um I got a little bit of a problem. Um, you know, if you say it's a strategic plan and the way forward and budget and all that, and we um, and and CIFO come in before the department. I thought the department will lead, and then um, the other two entities of of the um, department will follow. Because I can't see how they can budget and strategize without a strategy plan from the department. So I think we do this whole thing vice versa. Uh, and I don't know if I'm wrong. I mean, I will, um, but maybe the other members can help me if I'm right or wrong. Thank you. It's your views. Uh, let's see. Uh, hear from the, the content advisor because this portfolio committee has got a content advisor as well as the house chairperson because each time both slots are being approved by him. Uh, Small, can you say uh, something? Morning, Chairperson. Uh, morning, honorable members. Uh, in fact, it, it's supposed to work that way, Chairperson. Uh, either uh, the department comes first or the department comes immediately after the entities. Uh, but as we are aware, Chairperson, there is a request uh, from the department. Uh, I'm not sure if, Bra King, you can speak to that because uh, I'm not even aware if there is a, a new <clears throat> or proposed date as to when the department will come through and present its own uh, straight plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bra King. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Good morning, honor, honorable members. Um, well, it's something uh, according to the agenda that has just come in. Uh, and then I would, have, I would have expected maybe honorable Kroger that maybe would have uh, asked when we're doing the, 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 the committee program yesterday. However, we received the chairperson received the letter from the department indicating that they were requesting that their uh, presentation be not to be scheduled uh, this week because they have got some information that they wanted to include in their strategic plans and in their annual performances Hence, then the interaction between the department and the entities they had finalized in terms of uh, showing the, the uh, entities' annual plans. So now, hence, then we started with the entities because their annual plans and their corporate plan has been, had been tabled in Parliament. And looking at the time that uh, we are expected as the committee to finalize the budget vote uh, report prior the budget vote debate. So the budget vote debate is on the 10th of May. 
And then hence we scheduled that we get the presentation this week because the following, the coming week, it is the leave period for parliament. So now we, the department has been granted that uh, 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 request. Now a date will be scheduled where we'll be getting the presentation from the department after they have tabled their strategic plan and their annual performances in, in parliament. However, there's no transmission if we start with the entities. Depend because we can start with the department, we can start with entities, then the department uh, uh, takes everything after it, the entities has uh, presented. So those that's the information that uh, we have in uh, Honorable uh, Kruger via your uh, chairperson. Thank you, Brakin. Um... Honorable Kruger, thanks for your question. It was not a bad question. You wanted clarity. It has been clarified. I won't uh, dwell much again on it. That's the position. So, Ma'am Chair, I'm, Ma I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but um, it doesn't sound um, a good practice or it doesn't look like good practice. Um, I'm sure the entities must be, their strategy must be informed by the, um, the, uh, the department strategy. And if the department strategy is not approved, um, although it will be tabled in parliament, and hence, that's why I said yesterday, um, when CEDA um, tabled their strategy that we noted, you must remember we never approved the APPs. So I don't know if we are wasting our time. I mean, I'm, I'm gladly listening to to, to CIFA, but if 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 CIFA tabled a strategy today and this new information coming from from uh, the department, surely we're going to change that strategy. So, you know, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm in the dark here. Uh, you are in the dark, but the explanation we gave is because of a certain information which they discovered that uh, the, the department says um, because they, they, they collaborate with other departments, you know, you know that. So that's why I'm saying uh, we don't know what is behind the scene. The entity, the agency is working with the department to close. So I believe there won't be any problem, according to me, the way the minister has explained it to me, rather than bringing something which, is, which hasn't been tabled to parliament and which has got some omission which they were instructed to feature into that particular plan. So I don't think that we are wasting our time. As King and uh, Smo has indicated that there is no strange mess whether we start with the agency or with the department, because those people are working together. And if ever uh, honorable members can wait for the department, what you are going to uh, stress is to adhere to the time frame. That's what we have told them. And I believe that they have seen that the, the budget vote is on the 10th of May. Before that, something must be happening in between. So, at that note, we'll have to proceed. Thank you. I'm proceeding. I indicated the purpose of the meeting, and you are warmly welcome. Let's continue praying for our country. The issue of rain, it is predicted that it is still coming. We don't know now in which province. So, God must help us in this regard. Um, King, take us to the to the next item. The meeting is officially opened. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, uh, good morning, honorable members. Good morning, uh, uh, Chairperson of the board, DG and colleagues from Parliament and from the department. Chairperson, in the platform, I've uh, 
uh, identify to you, Honorable uh, Matulelwa, Honorable Nkosi Lutuli, Honorable Jacobs, Honorable Kruger, Honorable Tivilias, Honorable April, Honorable Tlobelang, and Honorable Mieni. So those are the members that I've identified. Should I have made a mistake, they can indicate those that I didn't see. And then uh, on the side of the apologies, Chair, I have received the apology of the minister who is uh, attending the roadshow, which is in the Western Cape. And then I've also received the apology of uh, Honorable Zumula, who is out with the Portfolio Committee on uh, Mineral and Energy. They are conducting an uh, oversight somewhere in Houghton. So those are the apologies that I have received. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Brakin. Um, apologies noted. Can um, we... Just on a point of clarity, is the Deputy Minister in? Mm. Brakin? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm still checking on the platform whether he's uh, in, because sometimes he joins with the with the other gadget. I can ask uh, uh, Mandla, is the Deputy Minister in? Mr. Stoller, can you assist? Ebra hey, King, you will you will recognize him once he's in so that we, we don't waste time, we must proceed with our program. Okay, and I I move I have a mover for the adoption of the agenda is honorable members. Good morning, Chair. I move for the adoption. Thank you. Any second for the adoption? Of the agenda. Honorable Mieni, two seconds. Thank you. Um, King, you you only mentioned um, honorable members. You never mentioned the the leadership of the of the agency. Oh, oh. Who's, who's, who's leading them? Uh, <laughs> Chairperson. Yes. That's Mr. Uh, that's Honorable Mieni. I got a problem mm. in my place, man. Load trading is at 10. Yo. Hey, it's difficult. Yeah. No, we're, we're experiencing same problem, all of us, Honorable Mieni. We can see that we have got that commitment. King, can you come in again? Because I yes, did. Chair. Mm. Uh, chair, in the platform we do have the DG, and then mm. we so have uh, the chairperson of a uh, small enterprise finance agency, uh, the board, uh, Mr. Martin Mahosi. Okay. I assume these are the leaders of uh, the entity and the department. Thank you. Yes. Mm. In the absence of the the minister, I will request the DG to lead the team. Good morning, Chair and other members. I hope I'm audible today. Um, I really ah, don't you are you are audible today. <laughs> okay, no, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I really don't want to waste time, but to allow the chairperson of the board of CIFA uh, to lead the delegation. We'll be here uh, to listen and to respond to questions uh, later on. Uh, Mr. Mahosa. Thank you, thank you, DJ. Um, Thank you, Honorable Chairperson um, and Honorable Members. With me, I have uh, the CEO of CIFA, Mr. Machamba, 
uh, is also accompanied by the team from CIFA. I won't mention them by name, each one of them. Uh, so I know, Chairperson, that we, we've lost a bit of time. Uh, let me save time and, and not uh, make too many comments like I would normally do. Uh, perhaps uh, go straight to him to, to present. Suffice to say that the, the, you will notice in the presentation that um, there's been a shift mainly in the format of the strategy plan of CIFA. Uh, key also to that uh, presentation today is a reflection on the performance, of course, against the, the MTSF uh, targets that we've set ourselves to see where we are and where we're intending to be as per the APP provisions. And let me not waste time, Chairperson, and hand over to, to Mr. Machamba to lead the presentation. Uh, but King DG, I must also acknowledge your, your presence also. Um, let me hand over to, to Mr. Machamba. Uh, Bob King, if we could just allow him to, to have access so that he can fly the presentation. Thanks. Mr. Machamba, over to you. Honorable Chair, Honorable Members of the Committee, the Board Chairperson, DG and colleagues, thanks for the opportunity to allow us to come and table the APP for the year ending March 2023. Uh, thanks, King, for allowing me, allowing me to share. Let me just reorganize the screen share with your permission. Um, I hope, Chairperson, the presentation is uh, visible from your side and to the committee members. Yes, it is visible. Thank you. Um, that's the first slide chair that looks really at the overview of the presentation. Um, I will not bore you with that. Uh, the presentation was shared to the members in the interest of time. And also given that we have challenges of people losing connection and chair also to give you the comfort that CIFA is here with the leadership of the chairperson, in the DG, myself and the team, and there is no other board meeting that is being held elsewhere by CIFA that will interrupt the proceedings of the committee as it was alleged yesterday. So we look now straight to the context of CIFA planning process. So I won't bother the committee really about this because this gives a history of the formation of CIFA, which was incorporated in April 2012. And, and I will just zoom into really the, 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 the guidelines that actually um, 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 guide the presentation of the work that we're going to present uh, this year. Except to say, Chair, that we have departed from the prior year's presentation of the corporate plan in view of the upcoming uh, merger between CIFA and, uh, and CEDA, including um, the, the COP the CBDA, we've tried, tried now to align our planning actually and the presentation of this work uh, uh, to, to be aligned to the new uh, strategic plans, annual performance plans planning framework that has been developed by DPME. Um, so I just want to remove the, the screen on top of my, uh, what to call, my presentation that is abstracting the, 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 I don't know what this thing, my word, okay. I just have to leave with that. Um, the, 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 the planning framework chair really focuses on the results-based methodology, which really underpins the theory of change concept, which in turn informs the manner in which government institutions should be developing uh, its short and medium term plans. The focus of a five-year strategic plan should primarily be at the level of impact and outcomes, with the annual performance plans mostly articulating the outputs and the, and the operational plans focusing really on the activities and resources that are required for implementation. This is the, the, the results-driven framework that we're using, Chair, which looks at the bottom from inputs as articulated, which is mainly about what we use to do our work the next step is activities. What are the things that we do? The outputs, what do we produce or deliver? And outcomes, what we wish to achieve? And finally, the impact, what we aim to change. And if you look, Chair, uh, uh, the impact and outcomes, they range between three and five years. 
your activities, uh, inputs, activities, and, and, uh, and uh, outputs, they focus for a period of one to three years. This is a new reporting framework that was actually established by TPME, and CIFA now has aligned itself with this uh, new reporting framework. This chair also is a high-level strategic plan which looks really on one on the far left, the strategic plan, which focuses on our mandate, our strategic focus areas, measuring our performance, and then the description of the technical indicators. Then at a lower level, it is your annual performance plan, which is what we're tabling to today, also aligned to, the, to, the, to our mandate, our strategic focus, um, measuring our performance and technical indicators. Then at an operational level, Chair, those are the areas and activities that we would be tabling. But uh, we don't usually bother the committee with the ops plan because that is really within the ambit of the management. We will therefore keep this presentation to the level of the annual performance plan as requested. The CIFA strategic framework. Um, if you look at the strategic framework of CIFA, at, at the top is our legislative mandates and policy mandates, uh, and also our vision, the mission, our values, our impact, and, outcome in, and outcomes or results. This is where really one will be focusing on which is really the first the outcome is the enhanced access to finance by SMEs and cooperatives. Second one being an enhanced service delivery and stakeholder satisfaction. The third one being a financial sustainable organization. And the fourth one, leverage strategic assets and capital raising. And finally, sound governance and high performance organization. All these chair are actually gonna be covered in the presentation. Now, looking at the, the legislative framework that really informs uh, 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 our work, we look, for example, uh, right at the top, the national policy directives directing the focus areas of CIFA, and then we zoom into foundational policies informing the work of CIFA, and then at the operational level, look at sector-based policies informing the work of CIFA. Uh, like at the national policies level, you look at NDP, you look at the MTSF, you look at the National Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan, and then the National Spatial Development Framework. At the foundational policy level, it is your national strategy on the development and promotion of SMEs, the integrated small business strategy, integrated strategy on promotion of entrepreneurship and small enterprises, the National Industrial Policy Framework, and also the IPAP, Framework on gender responsive planning, budgeting, monitoring, and evaluation, and auditing, and the white paper on an integrated national disability strategy. And then at the sector level, it is all those policies actually that are listed there, Chair, which I will not bother the committee with the details. This is the business model, Chair, of CIFA going forward, really. There is no serious departure from the old business model, but we are trying now, Chair, as we are actually moving forward to implement this um, a, a, a strategy to ensure that we are actually conscious of the upcoming what we call a measure with the three other sister agencies. Right at the top chair, as I mentioned in my previous slide, we're looking at the what, that is the impact of CIFAS exports, which I've covered earlier, sustainable small, medium, micro, and cooperative enterprises. The what also looks at increased economic participation, ownership, and access to resources and opportunities to previously disadvantaged individuals, mainly prioritizing women, youth, and persons with disabilities. Now looking at the how at the center, that is the safer operations now. On top of this is the post-investment management and graduation. Uh, the channels there that we use is CEDA, and there are business advisors and CIFAS post-investment offices. This is one of the critical areas of the work of CIFA, because after you've granted the loan, you need to make sure that you provide the necessary support for the SMME to succeed in implementing their operations and business ideas so that they are able really to pay back the money. The pillars of that is direct lending, which I know the, 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 the members know about it, and the channels being the regional offices, and now the automation that we're putting in place, to allow our clients to access our services. The second pillar is wholesale lending, 
Um, and, and then the third one is credit guarantees. If maybe I can go back to, to just explain the wholesale lending, that's where we provide lending to financial partners or, or intermediaries who then on land to our end users. Then credit guarantee, the channel there is a financial and supply development partner institutions. In the main, we partner there with uh, the commercial banks and other supplier development entities in the corporate space. Then the fourth pillar is fund management and ancillary services. This area, Chair, we are actually elevating it because during the COVID period, CIFA was inundated with a lot of work that was not part of the APP. And some of the work involved government departments who asked CIFA to be the fund manager or project manager in implement of their interventions. We're doing work with the Department of Land Reform. We're doing work with the Department of Tourism to be one of their what project implementers. And he said we needed to elevate this pillar because it takes a lot of resources of CIFA and we needed to ensure that we have this actually um, um, uh, well capacitated. And the approach there really is mainly cost recovery or margin model. Then we have the property portfolio management. Uh, 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 this one, the principle really is user pays, cost recovery, and margin model. Then at the base of that is the credit risk management because before we provide these loans, we need to assess the risk profile of all the applicants, to ensure that uh, they will manage the exposure and also limit the potential losses that CIFA uh, were to incur if we didn't actually manage this area. At the foundation level, which now which underpins all these pillars in the roof of the CIFA house reform equality, is a sector thought leadership and institutional capacity building with our partners, stakeholder partnerships and mobilization. This is the work chair that we've been doing in support of the department, particularly the minister, we've actually really aggressively started engaging our stakeholders through these roadshows, working closely with the municipalities, both district, metro, and local municipalities. And we are going to look at ensuring that the CIFA services chair are much more accessible to the people, more especially those who are in the rural areas who don't have the monies to travel to our, our offices in these different provinces. The work that we want to be doing there is use a lot of automated services in these local municipalities, working closely with the LED offices so that people are able to load the applications at the closest port of call. And the municipalities for us is one of the areas where we believe our people should be able to access CIFA services. And then the key pillar is sound governance financial sustainability, and organizational effective, effectiveness and performance of the entity. Because we cannot be actually having qualified audit and negative findings if we are to be managing other people's monies and also informing the businesses on how best to run their operations if we are not internally organized as an entity. Okay. Now we're looking at the, 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 the collaboration now. There's this irritation on top of the screen. That's really hiding uh, 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 my, my gosh, the headings. But they were looking at the collaboration chairperson between CIDA and CIFA. And that's a work chair that we'd like to really highlight going forward that we're going to improve in these areas, but largely in the area of pre-investment support, where we rely in the main on CIDA to provide the pre-investment readiness for our clients, the assistance with business plans, the client assessments, providing the BDS interventions, compile quality applications that focus on CIFA, uh, define programs. And CIFA, on the other hand, will be actually managing the due diligence work, the debt management, the collections, and ensuring that the performance of the work call of these clients is, is sustained. On post investment monitoring and support, the main area of focus that chairperson is on TRAP and SME relief. The CEDA focuses really on assisting the funded clients with mentorship, coaching, business performance, diagnosis, and other related services. And CIFA then comes in with focus on data management, including collections, rescheduling of uh, loan installments, restructuring of debt, uh, and pro proactive portfolio management. I won't bore the committee chair with the details as the report or the presentation was shared with the members. On funding programs, uh, CEDA focus really in the main is the TRAP and the Youth Challenge Fund, uh, pre-funding support, business registration, training, and capacity building, Chair. We've actually learned a lot when we're rolling out the Youth Challenge Fund. 
where we received chairperson in close to 2,500 applications and only 98 chairperson of these applicants in the Youth Challenge Fund were complete. And we had to take a majority of them to CEDA to assist them to complete the applications. Basic information like loading the business plan, loading the CIPC registration documents. And that's the work that uh, we are collaborating with CEDA to ensure that once these, uh, these applicants are able uh, uh, to complete that work, um, 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 uh, we then uh, CEDA takes over and run with the work. And then from CIFA side, side, application, due diligence and, and adjudication, contracting and disbursement of funds once CEDA has done the sanitizing of some of these uh, 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 poorly prepared documents, if I may say. Then also work around strategic partnerships in priority groups. CEDA focus on providing business development support services to our partners in the ecosystem, targeting entrepreneurs with disabilities, youth and women-owned entrepreneurs, and CIDA comes, CIFA rather comes to provide funding support and access to finance for these entities. And uh, marketing and business development here, Chair, we're doing joint marketing and outreach campaigns. And also we have co-locations in uh, sharing offices in certain municipalities. Um, and uh, monitoring and evaluation and research. We actually gonna be implementing an integrated planning, monitoring and evaluation framework uh, uh, between ourselves and CIDA and also form strategic partnerships with the institutions of higher learning and other research partners. With systems, we as we are moving chair towards automation, we're sharing the systems that we use because some of the clients that we refer back to CEDA, we need to make sure that those clients actually are able to maximize the use of the systems that CIFA has. And we're sharing actually the use and the training of the system with our colleagues at, at CEDA in that regard. Uh, let's see, this is frozen. Now looking at the operational, the operating environment for CIFA, uh, the strength of the entity, we, CIFA is likely to continue obtaining budgetary allocations uh, to issue loans and grants as well as non-financial support due to the mandate that we that is aligned to the national development plan the uh, CIFA's financial and corporate governance system is quite strong as we have received clean audits for a period of eight years a specific customization of deal structuring allows CIFA centric but course allows client centric solutioning of, of our clients to more especially in the wholesale funding space where we design and customize the funding of the particular intermediary to meet the, the needs of its uh, of our end users. Another strength is that we have a secure IT infrastructure and effect efficient software in place, providing strong security for CIFA. So far, we have not really uh, seen any attack uh, from the from the what we call the attackers who have attacked the CIDA, for example, and other public entities. Wicked weaknesses. The major weakness share is a relatively small balance sheet of about 2.7 billion, which really restricts our ability to massify the lending interventions that CIFA needs to roll out in the market. Lack of stability in the policy making environment is leading to inconsistency in program implementation. The target market is mostly unaware of the CIFA services and benefits, and we are countering this chair by actually increasing a CIFA had a zero there two years ago, had no budget for marketing. Last year, we started budgeting about 5 million. And this year we set aside uh, about 9 million rents to intervene uh, in the marketing space to make our target clients aware of the CIFA services. There is a low skills level of applicants influencing the quality of the applications as we saw with the Youth Challenge Fund, as well as lack of access to technology and for required submissions in certain areas, particularly those in the rural areas. Uh, inadequate staff capacity at CIFA, resulting in poor processing and turnaround times. This chair hit us very hard in the past two years because during the COVID period, as CIFA was expected to roll out a lot of short-term and urgent government interventions, starting with the COVID relief program, followed by the uh, uh, business recovery program, followed by the intervention that we put in place with the department to support businesses that were affected by the riots in KZN, 
And now we have to look at the work around assistance of SMEs that were affected by, by the floods in the Kazakh and in parts of the Eastern Cape. This work needs capacity that was not in place at CIFA. And what it has done, it has taken a lot of the time of the limited resources that are supposed to be driving the ordinary loaning uh, lending business to focus on these intermediate, what called immediate and urgent interventions. And also with the, with the measure that is coming and having um, recruitment on a permanent basis being uh, frozen, CIFA now is beginning to feel the pinch and we're struggling with regards to capacity to roll out some of these programs. And we hope with the, with the finalization of the measure, or even before then, we will be in a position to fill some of the positions here, even if it's for 12 to 24 months, to bridge that capacity gap that we're facing at the present. The other issue was lack of automation of certain business processes. And in this new financial year, we will be actually rolling out automation right across the product range of CIFA. And uh, with properties, we have age infrastructure resulting in increased expenses of managing the properties, including repairs and maintenance, and ensure that we secure and attract quality tenants. Opportunities, uh, CIFA has a competitive pricing model and cross-sectoral -sect funding. Um, the MESH entity, we are hoping that it will be able to offer a one-stop shop facility and leverage increasing level of involvement from the private sector to expand support SMEs, particularly and smaller players issuing loans, issuing loans to SMEs with shorter turnaround times. That is our intermediaries. And that opportunity is existing unbanked and underbanked or under underserved SMEs can expand, uh, can be rather expanded by CIFA. CIFA can also leverage external funding making it an implementer of choice for strategic partners, e.g. the EU. Hello, Chair, am I not audible? Hello, King? King? Yes, I, uh, yes uh, Mr. CEO, I can, can hear you. We are okay. still audible. Okay, okay. All right. Um, the... Then looking now at the what we call the threats, is the main threat really is the high impairment rate and debt right of the CIFA, which is really leading to the erosion of our capital as an entity. In the property space, the rental boycotts uh, really obstructs the collections targets. The political mistrust between the private sector and government is negatively impacting on the execution of the KCG program because the commercial banks require long and tedious due diligence processes before they can accept the KCG offering. The highly regulated legal environment is also affecting the KCG insurance licensing conditions. And as I mentioned earlier, staff of attrition, uh, which leads to loss of institutional knowledge and delayed decision making because of the limited staff resources and also concerns raised by staff who have been overworked with all these short term and um, immediate interventions that we needed to put in place, but there's not been a, a what we call remuneration to really uh, uh, give the staff the motivation for the hard work that they've done. Uh, it has really resulted in low staff morale, and we're seeing uh, people actually leaving the entity in numbers, which is a worrisome factor. Uh, sorry, my thing is still um, the challenges now that are faced by the SMEs, um, one of the main challenges for startups is sourcing or raising of funds, finding customers, competition from other firms, internal market burdens, wearing too many hats where the entrepreneur is Asia, is finance, is MD, and is everything, lack of guidance, more especially for the startups, the government policies that are seen as burdensome by the SMEs, tax, and the relevant uh, uh, related bureaucracy, um, entrepreneurship education, primary and secondary level, as well as government entrepreneurship programs, inadequate equipment to work and execute their, their operations. Uh, for those SMEs that are at a growth stage, one of the key challenges is lack of funding, access to or cost of finance, poor sales or inadequate technology, 
competition from large businesses, local economic conditions, bad in some regulations, lack of adequate skills, the cost of labor, growth and scale to meet client needs, space to operate, and, uh, and crime and theft, but like for those that are township-based and actually using cash to, to sell their services. Now, zooming chair into the strategic priorities that inform this APP. Uh, the key really is uh, building a sustainable loan book, and then we'll do that by expansion of the credit and decreasing impairments, investment and building of sustainable black-owned financial intermediaries, and we will focus on building client sustainability, implementing of a coherent strategy to raise capital in order to grow the loan book, implementation of loan programs that are responsive to government policies and program. The second one is improving performance on key development indicators. We'll do that by introducing targeted loan programs to promote financial inclusion, and strengthen focus on enterprises owned by youth, women, and people with disabilities, and those based in rural and township areas. We also do that by strengthening capacity of the microfinance division, which has been undercapacitated over time, with the challenges really related to us being unable to recruit with speed uh, due to the frozen uh, recruitment processes as a result of the pending measure, and also to grow uh, 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 the number of SMEs that actually provide, rather, intermediaries that provide microfinance and reduce our reliance on two major uh, micro lenders. The third one is improving the cost structure. We'll do that by driving cost efficiency, into the introduction of the funding model and right sizing. We'll fast track systems development and digitization. We'll implement a turnaround strategy for the properties portfolio and also strengthen our post-investment capability to improve the performance of the loan book. The fourth priority is uh, um, enhancing organizational capabilities across CIFA value chain. We'll do that by establishing a project management capability to drive new organizational projects, including a major consideration. We will also establish a treasury function in the match entity to better manage the capital raising and funds that are invested by the entity. We'll conclude the organizational review process and optimize the functioning of CIFA or the new entity. We'll also establish KCG and KPP as fully operational subsidiaries of CIFA. The fifth pillar, the last one, is building the CIFA brand and increasing CIFA visibility. And we'll do this by increasing investment in marketing and client outreach. Will strengthen, will strengthen collaboration with key participants or, or key players in the, in, the, in the ecosystem, that is public and private sector and donors, and will strengthen CIFA sectoral research and knowledge management capabilities. The outcomes chair, which is the key. Um, I will not bore with the details, but I'll zoom into the targets for the financial year 2022-2023. The value of approvals, to small and medium enterprises, our target is 2.2 billion, and the value of disbursements is 2 billion. The number of SMEs and cooperatives to be financed is 84,000. The number of jobs to be facilitated is 104,000. And disbursements to black owned enterprises are looking at 1.4 billion. And disbursements to women owned enterprises are looking at 802 million. And disbursements to youth owned enterprises, we're looking at 601 million. Disbursements to enterprises that are owned by entrepreneurs with disabilities, we're looking at 140 million. Disbursements to township based on entities is 501 million. And for those entities that are rural based, our target is 802 million. Um, when looking at the lending, turnaround times, direct lending, we want to conclude uh, application to disbursements for applicants within 40 days. Um, for the wholesale lending, we're looking at 55 days. Uh, KCG, capital leveraging ratio, we target to do 6.25 times. And the percentage growth in revenue, uh, we're looking at 10% at, at for the new financial year. Um, the progress in the automation of safer businesses, we target by the end of this financial year 100% 
automation of the due diligence and PIM workout and recovery and re work or recover, workout and re recovery processes. Phase one of uh, implementation of enterprise content management will also be concluded this year. A number of publications to be produced. We target to produce six sector value chain analysis reports uh, by, by annual business condition survey and a loan program performance report to look at the performance of our loans. Um, looking at the improved credit risk, a uh, blended first default rate of 6%. Here, Chair, we're referring to clients that we fund and who miss their very first step in order. And we want to reduce that rate to, to, to about 6%. A uh, number of clients and funding partner interventions with our partners. We need to provide about support to about 165 of those, more especially our intermediaries with regards to capacity building. And the number of clients that improve their turnover by 5%, we target about, we have about 30 of those. And then the portfolio at risk, we're targeting to limit it at about 42%. Portfolio at risk is all those, um, what we call uh, clients who are behind in their payments by 60 plus one day. And then looking at accum accumulated impairments, we target to limit our impairments at this stage at 38% and uh, the collections rate to improve to 87%. Uh, looking at uh, enhanced uh, uh, risk maturity, we want to maintain a level three risk maturity level as CIFA, and um, enhanced financial management and performance. The cost income ratio, we want to limit it down to 69%. And the rent value of additional capital raised, we want to raise additional capital outside of government funding of 360 million. And the cost income ratio for the properties is around 412%. This one share is quite high because of the uh, rental buy courts and illegal tenants that we're actually going to be evicting or trying to formalize the relationship with them and ensure that they pay for the rent, including the cost of uh, uh, utilities and electricity. A improvement of the letable area by to up to 60% and rental collections rate of 40%. And um, looking at the, 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 the number of leads that we generate from the strategic relationships that we build, we are building, we're looking at uh, about 100 leads to be generated. The annual brand visibility index for CIFA we want to actually have a, an achievement of about 50% brand visibility index. The annual customer satisfaction index rating of 83%. And um, employee engagement index of 65%. And uh, looking at the percentage of employees who achieve at least above 3.5% performance on the annual performance, we want at least about 55% above of our staff to achieve more than 3.5% against the annual targets. And the productivity index development uh, will establish a baseline in this current financial year. Chair, as I approach the close of this uh, report, we here were just showing the spatial spread of SMMEs in the South African economy. We'll see that about 34% of the SMMEs are in Gauteng, followed by 16% in KwaZulu Natal, 12% in the Western Cape, 10% in the Eastern Cape. 9% in Pumalanga and Limpopo, 5% in the Northwest, 4% in the Free State with the Northern Cape having about 1% of the spread of the SMMEs. And this chair informs the, the throughput of applicants from, from each province. And this is really informed by the structure of our economy where a majority of the big industries are located are actually reflected in this pie chart. Um, this now just gives us the numbers of SMMEs per province. For example, there are about 278,000 in the Western Cape, 232 in the Eastern Cape, 20,000 in Northern Cape, 97,000 in Free State, 381,000 in Wazulu Nata, 111,000 in the Northwest, 786,000 SMMEs in Gauteng, 197 in Pumalanga, 218,000 in Limpompo, which gives us the 2.3 million uh, SMEs in the country. Now, so if you look at um, the, the distribution of, or rather, the, the disbursements that CIFA 
made in the past three years, starting from 2019, 2020 to February 28, 2022, in the Eastern Cape, we dispersed 348 million. Free State, 127 million. Gauteng, 1.5 billion. Informed by that big number of SMEs, KwaZulu Natal, 823 million. Limpompo, 596 million. Pumalanga, 359 million. Northern Cape, 69 million. Northwest, 241. And the Western Cape, it's 659 million. We did initially chair, and I must bring the members to comfort that this plan was reviewed jointly with the department, and the department made these inputs, and to ensure that there's alignment between this plan and the work that the department will be tabling here later. After, inter after interactions with the department, we plan, for example, chair, to disperse in the Eastern Cape 146 million. The department came back and said, let's reprioritize our budget and start allocating more money to these provinces that are underserviced. You will see, Chair, if you compare the original targets of, of, of 146, 16K53, Free State, 644, Houting, and so on and so forth, we increase now the, the targets. For the Eastern Cape, it moves from 146 million for this year to 232 million. Free State, 53 million to 232 million. Gauteng, 644 million, we reduced it to 208 million. KZN, from 347 million down to 200 million. Limpombo, 251 million to 232 million. Bumalanga, 151 to 232. So if you look at this, the majority of our funds now are going to be going to these underfunded provinces. But the key issue here is that you cannot say when the Eastern Cape is sitting with funds that are not being attracted by SMEs and Gauteng has run out of funds and keep the money locked up there until the year ends. We will have to allow the flexibility to move the funds around to address the funding requirements of SMEs in areas where there is traction. That's one. Two, we will need now to look at the capacity of the people in those regional offices. Because once you increase the numbers that must be actually processed in those provinces, that should be actually accompanied by the increase in the resources that must do the work on the ground. Because currently, the capacity that sits in the provinces will not be able to deliver these numbers. We therefore, with speed, will have to relook the capacity that sits in those provinces so that this money doesn't get locked up there without being dispersed to the real economy. So that's the work that we're going to be engaging the department to ensure that this is addressed with immediate effect. Otherwise, this money will have to go back to Gauteng, KZN, Eben, and the Western Cape. And Chair, I won't bore you with this because this speaks really to the alignment that I spoke to, that this work that we're tabling here was tabled was shared with the department. The department made these inputs to ensure that it is aligned, number one, to the, to the, the objectives of the department and outcomes. And each and every one of these activities uh, are aligned to the work of the department as reflected on these two tables. Uh. So we want to give the committee the comfort that this APP speaks to the, the APP of the department and it also speaks to the performance contract of the minister. So quickly, as I close, uh, yeah, look at the financial outcomes. This APP chair and the budget were prepared in line with the priorities of CIFA corporate annual performance plan. Um, they are for the period of the, which is more like the third year of the five year strategic plan. We are slightly more than halfway the, the, the MTS period. The financial year 2023 budget has been prepared on and on going as, as a going concern. And the budget assumes that CIFA will continue to operate in its current form, not ignoring the work of merging the two entities. But as we sit now, we have to do the work in this current form, but ensuring that there is that collaboration with CIDA in particular. It is key that CIFA finds a balance between these priorities while ensuring that financial sustainability, developmental impact, and overall operational efficiency is protected. Because, Chair, you'll remember that sometimes CIFA gets attacked for allegedly behaving like a corporate bank, which I refuse to accept, and also when we table the impairments that we face as an entity, because we were clear in our minds that we've got a development mandate, 
But that developmental mandate must not be seen as reckless lending that will end up eroding the capital base of the entity. So as we implement our work as an entity, we are trying by all means to ensure that one, you drive the, the, the developmental mandate, but to ensure the sustainability of the entity so that we don't become part of the other public entities that went kept in hand to the treasury year in and year out to ask for operational funding. The overall impact of the above is reflected uh, in the budget net asset value of CIFA, which is expected to increase from 927 million in March 2021 to 2 billion at the end of the MTSF period, in March 2025. Finally, Chair, if you look for the plan for the, 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 the year 2023, our income, we actually want to see it increase from 818 million to just above 1.049 billion. Expenses will actually be around 908 million. We anticipate, uh, and members will remember, if you look at the year that ended last month in March, there was a debate last year with people coming with their financial understanding of education that now CIFA is rubbishing the committee. Last year, uh, we had to reverse that tax after the, 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 the SARS allowed us to exclude grants received from government from tax. That 270 million that was debated last year, now it is being reversed. Hence, you see that marginal loss of about before tax, or rather the, the, the profit after tax of 247 million. It is because of that adjusted tax. This coming year or the current year, Chair, we anticipate to have a profit before tax of 141 million and a net profit as a result of 140 million because CIFA has a, a number of assessed losses that we need actually to eradicate until we are able to, to really be profitable. And, and remember, if you've got assessed losses from prior year, you have to net them off against the, the profits or the losses of the subsequent years. Hence, you see the zero tax for the current financial year. And we anticipate that at the end of the year, we'll have a net profit of 141 million. Looking at our balance sheet, um, for the year 2023, the total assets will increase from 6.1 billion or 6.2 billion to 6.8 billion. And uh, our, our equity from 1.184 to 1.326 billion with liabilities increasing from 4.9 to 5.4 billion with a total then of equities and liabilities of 6.818 billion. I quickly chair, I spoke to cost income ratio. We expect it to be at 87%. Uh, in payments, we want to limit them at 38% as we improve our quality of the quality of our loan book. Chair, that brings us to the end of the presentation. I didn't want chair to bother the committee with the key risk enterprise and mitigation measures, but they are there, they are attached on the, on the presentation, and we do indicate how we are going to, as an entity, mitigate all the risks that are linked, by the way, to the key outcomes, the five, the five outcomes that I spoke to earlier on. Chair, so, with that said, uh, I will allow the committee to then take it, and hopefully the committee will adopt and approve the APP. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much for the detailed presentation and with his recommendation. I will now open for discussion. Honorable members, here we are. Can we engage with the report, with the presentation? Rakin, assist me by identifying honorable members' sons. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. So far, we've got uh, Honorable April. Mm. Yes. Only. This is the end that is so far showing, Chair. Okay. Honorable April. I was thinking, uh, Brakin will say, this is the hand of the man who's always raising. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone else. Uh, I want to thank you for the presentation that is made to us this morning. It has a lot of details in, it has a lot of plans in. 
Um, uh, mine is not a deep uh, uh, question of, of, of the strategy and so on and so forth, but it, I just want to check the financial year that ended now the 31st of March. I ask, can I have a report with regards to how many people or the numbers of people that has been assisted by uh, the, the seed alliance that has been assisted by CIFA? And I'm sure we must, you must be able to tell us uh, at least some number one or 10 or, or 50 or a thousand. Uh, you just need to check uh, people that were coming directly from SIDA, uh, how many of them has CIFA funded? Uh, just so that we can get a sense of what is happening with regards to that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Is there any other hand? Yes, Chair. It's uh, Honorable Matulelo. Yes. Honorable Matulelo, the stage is yours. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Honorable Jacobs. Okay. Okay. Honorable Matulelo. Can we get your inputs on the report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Continue to honorable members. Uh, my input is, Siva, uh, do you remember that we, we requested a report that is a detailed report? Because now, we said we all, oh, let me say, we agreed that we are no longer going to take uh, only the statistics and numbers and what. We need a detailed report, not the statistics. And we need to see those people that you are saying, you are, you, you, the numbers of the small businesses that you are, you are being helping in all provinces. We needed evidence, please. This thing of statistics is not working for us in this portfolio committee, please. I'm just raising that, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Jacobs. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and greetings, and thanks to the CEO and the Chair for the presentation. According to the C, the chairperson of the board, the entity anticipate approving loans to the value of 1.9 million during the upcoming 22-23 financial year and to disperse 1.5 million into South African economy, uh, benefiting more than 69,000 SMMEs and cooperatives. These enterprises in turn are expected to create and maintain more than 80,000 jobs over the period. These figures, however, does not correspond with the planned targets provided by CIFA. So I, I think there's just a one anomaly in, 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 in that. I think if we can just get a comment on, 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 on that. Um, disbursements. What could be the cause for CIFA to merge the disbursement targets of approximately 900 million rand? And, and I think this is a key thing. Uh, under expenditure and what's the what's the reason for this? Besides lowering of the target for disbursement compared to previous year, what measures have CIFA put in place to ensure that the disbursement targets um, are put in place to achieve it? And I think here we also learned from um, what the CEO talked about with the Youth Challenge Fund. You see, our people need capacity to help get them to act. They have an idea, but they don't have the equipment to fill in these forms. And the forms and it's the capacity and disburse, disbursement to the vulnerable groups remain a problem. Um, yesterday, we raised the issue of that CEDA have about 53 co-location points. CIFA is not, doesn't have organizational presence in all of them. Why can't we ensure that we have CIFA presence in all of those places, as well as some of our district. Um, because the president spoke about the district model, why can't we have uh, CIFA present in all of the districts? Um, the next question I want to ask is the, the discount, discounted rate-based pricing model. 
um, CIFA has a lending and credit business operating predominantly on this discounted risk-based pricing model. Yet, there is a acknowledgement of the low uptake of its products. Um, uh, what are we going to do, especially for projects like the, the TRIP, the T Township Rural and Entrepreneurial Program, which is supposed to help our people, but it's actually not. There's not a fit between people applying, people, the poorest of the poor, the informal traders, and not getting that. So how are we going to design? I'm, I'm pleased that there is going to be automation now. But what is going to come different? What What is going to be happening different? And, you know, the poor is struggling to, to make loans that they're not sure if they can pay back. Um, and I think what we need to do is just to find a model that works with improving your perf impairment performance, but at the same time also make it more accessible to our communities. Um, <clears throat> implementation of TREP has been weak. Design, uh, weekly, inconsistent implementation. How are you going to do it differently? Um, you have two MFMIs that provides micro and informal business uh, support. How are you going to ensure, especially in our province, here in the Western Cape, we don't have microfinance support. Um, most of those microfinance support facilities is up there in the northern provinces. And here we have uh, the Cape business or business partners that's not interested in the poor and the informal townships and our people on the Cape Flats. Are we going to ensure that uh, we get MFMIs play a more meaningful role? And what is CIFA's plan of action of turning around uh, the situation, especially for micro and informal business that needs the micro money? Look, people are looking not for big monies. They don't want a loan of a million rand, but they just need to get by um, 50,000 to get stock so that they can turn around and move away from the survivalist to, to, uh, to a, a better um, sustainable level. Um, could CIFO please elaborate on what it means by the lack of stability in policy making, and how can the PC of of this PC help in this regard? I think uh, it speaks to the the lack of a legislative framework, a small business legislative framework, um, uh, but it also speaks to the need for a more township, more inclusive, small, small business friendly framework. Um, thank you, Chair. Let me pause for, the, for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, honorable members. Just to add on what the last speaker has indicated, uh, to see that yesterday we spoke about uh, assisting our SMMEs on issues of training and also issues of um, business plans, which will, and financial management training include also financial management, which will also assist them uh, to, to retain back their money because this money must rotate. So just to support what Honorable Jacob has said. The pieces of legislation which we will be busy with as the department, uh, DG, must really focus on unlocking those bottlenecks. I mentioned this even yesterday to Sida. So I think I support what he's saying. Uh, the visibility which must be done by Sida should also be part of CIFA so that our people must be assisted. If you check on the number of uh, small businesses which have been uh, assisted, we're talking of 97 something out of 200 and something. So that really shows that there is no impact. The, the outcome is negative according to me. So we, we really appreciate the presentation, but at the same time, we need to look at those issues which have been raised by members. Uh, can I get responses from, from the department, from the agency, as well as the DG will speak later? Okay. Speak later. Okay. Yes, okay. King, 
Do we still have may, other yes. hands? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please may, may you please uh, recognize uh, Honorable Kruger so that the responses can uh, okay. be for all members that have asked. All right. But Honorable you. Kruger, the stage is yours. And I think you are answered. We are all answered that the plan was in consultation with the department. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. And apologies if, um, if there's a noisy background. I'm in a very noisy place. But I think it's important for me to ask. Um, there's only two questions that I want to ask. The one is, of course, um, we talk forever about the footprint of, of CIFA. And maybe um, if CIDA and CIFA is now one organization, um, it will increase the footprint. But I think in the past, um, CIFA used their lack of um, footprint. Uh, they use micro lenders. And the problem with micro lenders is um, it's a very expensive exercise. Yes, and I um, uh, agree with um, Honorable Jacobs that the small businesses only need small money, but I'm sure we can accommodate them with direct lending if our footprint is, um, is big enough so that um, each, and you will remember, we spoke a lot about it, that, that CIFA and CEDA have an office in each municipality. Um, and I think that will uh, sort out, and then we can do it direct line lending. We, we can cut out the micro lenders here. They most probably are small business owners, but um, to the cost of, of people lending money from them because the interest rates are very high. Um, that's my first point, Madam Chair. And the second point is um, my old story, red tape. Um, I, I um, tried to fold in a, a CIFA form. It's unbelievable red tape. Um, it's very difficult. Um, and I don't know how um, small businesses from rural areas manage to fill in this form. I don't even know how CEDAR uh, employees manage to fill in this form. So I, I, I think uh, with the marketing uh, budget that uh, CIFA are budgeting now, um, they can put some money aside from that budget to redesign their form and make it much easier for 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 grassroots levels, people in the street to uh, apply for a loan. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Honorable Jacobs. Um, that was Kruger. Madam Chair, that was Honorable Kruger. Um, yes, yes, I, and, I, and I, I know. You. Yeah, because I'm, I'm much more beautiful than Honorable Jacobs. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Kruger. Uh, you made your, 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 your input. I'm now inviting the department and its agency to respond. Thank you, Chairperson. We, we shall endeavor to, to share the, the response to the questions. For the ones that I won't be able to to cover, the, the CEO would would, uh, would assist uh, will assist to 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 help us to cover all the questions to respond to everything. Just to start off with a question that was posed by Honourable April, um, uh, we we at this uh, uh, session in this particular session, Chairperson, unfortunately, do not have that information off our fingertips. Uh, we you would recall, Chairperson, that. Uh, in the previous quarter, the, in the quarterly performances, that's when we, we basically provide the detail of the performance. We came prepared for, for, the, for the, uh, the APP, but we will gladly provide that detail uh, in the next uh, quarterly report when we, when we present to, to the portfolio committee. That, that is in relation to the number of CDA clients. 
that have been assisted by CIFA. In my understanding, uh, if I recall, both ourselves and CIDA do in fact cover uh, that, uh, uh, that that particular question. Same applies to to the report that uh, to the question that was asked by Honourable Matulelo on the the detail of the the approved SMMEs. Uh, Chairperson, you would recall that in the previous quarter we did in fact uh, uh, provide that report. We attached it as a supplement to our quarterly report. We did say that it's a report that we intend to improve on as we gather that information. If we time we report to the portfolio team. Uh, that is a report on the throughput in terms of how many applications were received, how many applications were approved, how many applications were, were declined, and so that we can also give the, the portfolio committee an indication of the um, common reasons why people were not making it through, uh, with the, uh, were not uh, able to succeed with their applications. Uh, Honorable Jacobs uh, raised a number of questions. I may be able to miss some. I picked up that the first one, it seemed like the there's the, some error. The, the correct number for the target for loan approvals is the 2.2 billion that is the point. The 1.9 billion, billion you would see that relates to to the previous target of the previous financial year. It is current financial year. I mean, the next financial year of the APP. So surely it must be, be some kind of an error. I don't know how it was picked up and it is attributed to myself, unfortunately. So, so I don't know what the error would have come up from. Uh, if there was such an error in our documentation, we apologize to the committee. The correct number is a 2.2 billion. We have no intention to, to mislead the committee. Uh, the disbursement targets, um, I wouldn't want to go, go too much in the detail. Uh, the, let me say, uh, ordinarily, normally, the, yes, we did miss the target, but the function of disbursement is something that lags after the approval because of the nature of the drawdowns. So it would partly be linked to the performance of that particular SMME. It wouldn't be linked to, to log jams on our side or delays on our side in terms of disbursement. Because the disbursement are in fact uh, provided or passed on to those SMEs in accordance with their drawdowns, uh, not necessarily because of, uh, of administrative uh, 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 blockages on the side of CIFA. The CA can expand more on that. Uh, the capacity of SMEs, we completely agree with Honorable Jacobs and the committee, uh, particularly with the indication, with the experience that we had with the, with the Youth Challenge Fund. Indeed, there's a need for us to capacitate the SMEs uh, and also to simplify our processes. Um, I'll comment that later as uh, Honorable Kruger's also question. But indeed, we agree that we, we need to, to continuously uh, try and capacitate the SMEs so that they can uh, be able to respond. Although it's not a direct function of CIFA, it's something that we work together with CIDA on. Uh, surely the, the Youth Challenge Fund issue uh, is something that, that points to that. But as the CEO indicated, and this talks also to collocation, one of the things that CIFA has been dealing with, and uh, I, I hope the Portfolio Committee has noted the significant improvement in terms of profitability that is being projected today, um, one of the key things that CIFA is always to be careful of is to balance the, the mandate and the responsibility that it has to bridge the, 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 the challenge of, of, of market, uh, market failure in terms of availing access to funding to, to small enterprises. Uh, but at the same time, we have to do it in a manner that is uh, prudent in a manner that it's responsible, in a manner that we don't get to be known as one of those SOEs that continuously receive money from government and are not able to, to sustain themselves in the long term. Yes, indeed, historically, CIFA has suffered a lot with the challenge of profitability. It is important that we strike the balance, therefore, of funding the SMEs at the same time, making sure that we do interact to some point of uh, at least uh, acceptable levels uh, of, of profitability, not to the expense of the, of the not in the same manner as a uh, private uh, sector would do, uh, in such a manner that it may disadvantage the SMEs. So, 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 so the key issue, the reason why I raise is that. Uh, yes. Yes. The, okay. The guy had the last There's an interference here. Yeah. So, so all right, let me continue. So, so the reason why I raise it is that what CIFA has been badly with you uh, in the last quarter, I uh, also report that CIFA is embarked on a project 
of uh, um, working on a funding model for CIFA. We need to understand what is it uh, that the cost structure of CIFA is vis-a-vis its ability to generate revenue and endeavor to make sure that there's, that there's a balance between them, such that we don't become too costly an organization uh, to the expense of us being able to, to disperse and approve and, and to approve loans to the clientele that we target. So the, the one problem that we have is that we can't overstretch ourselves and be in all points uh, as comrade as, as so that's honorable Jacobs indicator uh, relating to, to the co-location points with CEDA. Yes, indeed, our endeavor is to make sure that wherever CEDA is, it must be possible for CIFA clients and CEDA clients as one entity to be able to get full access to our services. Part of it being the intervention that the CEO indicated that we are moving towards the greater automation, but also uh, the fact that we we, we have uh, committed ourselves to train uh, the frontline people, including LED uh, offices in municipalities, so they can at least handle the basic requirements of being able to complete an application or the basic requirements uh, of product knowledge also, so that when a person walks into a municipality, wanting to find out about what happens or what access uh, of services and products he can get at, at, or she can get from CIFA, they get informed uh, in a manner that would be almost equal to them being informed by a CIFA person about the products that CIFA provides and at least some guidance on on on, the, the, on how applications are processed. So it's, a, it's something that we're going to continue to work on, improving our capacity uh, without overstretching ourselves, automation, and also empowering those that work with us uh, uh, in municipalities and any other partners that we may interact pick up uh, as, as we, we improve the performance of CIFA so that people can get full access to, 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 to the products that we provide. Uh, the MFMI, the two intermediaries, let me leave it to the CEO. We, we have increased that number, Honorable Jacobs. It's no longer two, you know, of, although two are still uh, quite uh, uh, dominant, as it is because of the historical uh, the, the background that we've always provided. Uh, from last year, we've started uh, working on increasing the number of, uh, of uh, onboarding new, new intermediaries uh, onto the services of CIFA. The CEO will give you a detail about the, 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 um, how many um, intermediaries, and we will continue. We are continuing to look for extra intermediaries that we can, in fact, bring in. We are very conscious of the fact that we need to stretch particularly into the coastal areas, um, the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape in particular, although there's been a bit of, of, uh, of penetration into KZM in as far as the intermediaries are concerned. Um, so, so, yeah, let me also leave the question of the performance of, on, 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 uh, on micro loans to the sea um, and the stability on the policy front. Let me leave it there just to clarify the uh, Honorable Kruger. Uh, there is a difference between the micro lenders, as understood, if I understood your question right, and the intermediaries that we use. We are not talking about the same um, um, uh, uh, service providers or, or, or entities. It's not the, the machonistas that are commonly known to machonistas out there in the market. In the case of intermediaries that we work with, we agree with them upfront on the cost. Uh, that they are supposed to, in fact, uh, uh, load uh, when they approve clients. So when we agree that you are allocated X amount for you to own, to, to own land, we kept that money. We kept that uh, the expense that is passed on to, to the end user to make sure that there is no negative bearing uh, to, to the people that, that they will be working with. So it is not as expensive as, as uh, uh, you may be want you may to believe. Uh, that is not the, the situation at all. Uh, so, so as we say, the issue, the reason why, just to emphasize, the reason why we use the intermediaries is precisely because the the cost of of loaning the smaller amounts that we are referring to is much more expensive for CIFA, and it would pose a risk on its sustainability if we just go direct uh, to that level. So it becomes a good balance, but also the positive side about it that we gain from it is that it gives us better leverage uh, in as far as the the development and impact indicators are concerned. So it's partners that we need, uh, that we, we we would need to continue to work with them uh, going forward. Whilst you also remain, would also have to remain 
uh, critical and, and quite vigilant to check what are the negative impacts so that we try and avoid those negative impacts where we can. And if there are improvements that we bring and we bring or more improvements in as far as that is concerned. We, we agree that uh, some of our clients may find the completion of the, of the forms more difficult. Uh, we did in fact report in the, during the COVID, uh, uh, the period that we were providing uh, processing COVID relief applications that we had extensively simplified the, the, the application forms that we're using in that regard. It's a procedure that we are continuing to, to maintain and we're looking for opportunities where we can to, to improve on that. It's a continuous, uh, it's continuous work that, that must follow. Um, we, we're quite conscious of that. So we can, we can reassure the committee that we are conscious of that and we, are, we remain open to, to whatever input that can be provided to us to ensure that we continue to, to make things easier. But we have to make things easier in a manner that we still maintain some level of being prudent. And because when, you don't, when, you do the, when, when we lose that element of being prudent, it also means that we are actually, we'll be actually in, in, introducing some level of risk that may not necessarily be good for CIFA itself. So the balance between the two, simplification, at the same time there's risk mitigation in as far as the the, the, the prudent processing or the correct processing the thorough processing of, of applications uh, would require in the case of the use challenge fund just to to explain uh, the issue was not necessarily the compli the complication of the forms it was just basic compliance a lot of the reasons why uh, the, the applications could not make it through and they are not discarded in any way was because they did not attach the necessary documentation, basic documentation uh, that the person applies. So in that, that cohort of non attach were referred to see as continue to assist them to make sure that they and they're able to, to, to resubmit the applications so that it may be processed. Let me, let me pause the chair. In case I've, 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 I've skipped anything, let me uh, ask the chair, I mean the CEO, uh, to, to, to respond to the questions that I've not been able to respond to. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, chair. And uh, I must admit the chair has covered a majority of the questions. I would just like to amplify a few areas uh, the question was raised by Honorable April around the number of entities that uh, were actually passed on by CEDA to CIFA for finance. Um, we, we will provide those numbers when we table uh, our, our next report to the portfolio committee because I must admit our focus here was really to focus on the tabling of the APP. But I must also caution that uh, when we provide lending, particularly direct lending, You've got clients who come directly to CIDA, CIFA, rather, and clients who apply online directly to CIFA, and there are clients that then come first to CIFA, and then we refer them back to CIDA, where there's a serious gap on the work that still needs to be done. But we have to do that analysis, but let's be clear, the access points for CIFA is not CIDA only. We have people who borrow through the online application process, We've got people who go through their private consultants and apply directly to CIFA. And we've got those people who apply through the commercial bank via the KCG, credit guarantee system. So we need to find a balance uh, 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 that you can't say CIFA will only find clients that uh, what to call um, um, uh, come from CIDA. Because that would be a wrong assumption of saying one size fits all. We've indirected Chairperson with the number of SMEs it is so far I've been to six provinces in the road shows. And what we're learning there from the ground is that people are saying, do not treat us all the same. If I'm an SMME who is an entrepreneur who's been operating for more than 10 years, don't take me to a training program of a guy who left school last year because my needs and training needs are not the same as that person. Let's have different interventions for different levels of development of the SMEs. So that's one of those are one of the realities that are emanating from the ground. 
but we will assist the committee with that work. Um, the, the question around the uh, policy issue that... Uh, I uh, missed uh, you, CEO. Yes, uh, am I audible, committee? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, um, let me know, King, if I disappear. Yeah, you disappeared, but you are back now. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to move to the question raised by Honorable Jacobs around the uh, issue of policy. What we're referring to there, Chair, is um, the regulations that are set up by the municipalities. For example, the issue of permits and other uh, uh, what are called regulations that are uh, uh, forced through the SMMEs, they impact on the cost of doing business for these SMMEs. The issues of administered pricing, the cost of electricity, that is one of the direct impact that this will have on the cost of doing business for the SMMEs. I won't even mention, Chairperson, the issue of load shed. The That's issue of uh, protection in there. The, the issue of, of, of load sharing. I mean, I was talking to one of our SMMEs who was running a restaurant. He was saying, Chief, if I've got ice cream in the refrigerator and there's load shedding, that ice cream melts, you can't refuse an ice cream. If it melts, it's rubbish. You have to throw it away. You know, there are those issues. And to buy a generator is not that cheap for these SMMEs. You know, so those are some of the issues that, uh, for example, we're referring to uh, 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 Honorable Jacobs. The, 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 I think the numbers chair on the document uh, and the targets, I think they are probably extracted from, from old uh, documents because our, our approvals planned for, for, for this current year that we're tabling is 2.2 billion and the disbursements are exactly 2 billion. And the chair did mention that uh, the disbursements, they track approvals because after approval, there are certain You're conditions. missing again. King? Uh, yes. Is it me or the chair? I think that is the chair's culture that is got a problem because you are audible to, to us. Chair, can you try to do something with your title or position yourself better? Can proceed. Thank you, thank you, King. Um, what we'll do, man, uh, Honorable Jacobs, is that we'll engage the research unit. Was I think they are using obsolete numbers uh, in that in that analysis. But uh, I'd like to say that uh, with the with the, how do we then anticipate to improve our 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 disbursements where there is uh, actually lack of? We have again. I'm going to mention these roadshows. We've learned uh, in these roadshows that. One of the key issues that we take for granted, particularly those of us who are from the urban areas, we think that it is simple to access uh, the offices of CIFA and CIDA. Um, in, in one small town in the Eastern Cape, uh, uh, Maclear, uh, 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 one of the, 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 the participants was saying, in order for them to access CIFA, they have to catch a taxi, from my clear to, to Enzobo, then another taxi from Enzobo to Amtata. By the time they get to Amtata, it's already two o'clock. Now this person must find a place to sleep once they have actually been served, if they're lucky, uh, by, by Sifa in the afternoon. Then catch two taxis again back home. The same experience was raised when we, we, we visited the Northern Cape, a town of, of, of Azvater, that to go to Kimberley. It costs money for these people who are really starting up their businesses. Hence, we said there is therefore a need to build one relationship with the provincial DFIs who have a better footprint in the provinces than us. Two, build a relationship with the municipal development agencies. And three, build a relationship with the LED offices of the local municipalities, where CIFA and CIDA now will have to train the officials in the LED office on basic product knowledge of the CIFA offerings. And then we will provide the portals where they can assist these, uh, these SMEs when they visit the municipalities to upload some of the documents uh, electronically in those particular areas. So that's the work that we're gonna be uh, doing a uh, chair going forward with, the, with, the, with these the relevant and strategic partners that we're gonna be working with. The option of pre-building CIFA offices in every municipality 
it's probably not financially viable because that is going to happen is that we'll have now to divest to, 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 to actually move the resources that were supposed to go to SMEs and pay salaries and rental for these new offices. So we believe that building and working with these strategic partners will be much more productive for, for ourselves and our, our clients. Um, the discounted risk-based model, Chair, we, we believe that uh, it is working now. We've seen uh, an improvement in the last quarter of, of the financial year that will report when we take we got a four. We've seen an improvement in the in the disbursements under trap. Um, um, for example, the disbursements that we did by end of March in trap for around 715 million. So we we will actually detail those numbers when we come back to 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 what call uh, to the committee. This discounted risk-based model really, more especially trap, will provide prime minus five there. On top of that, a majority of trade programs have got blended funds or a grant element, which makes them much more attractive and affordable to, to, the, to these SMMEs. Um, then looking at the issue of uh, um, um, how do we also plan to improve the uptake on trap, we've introduced Honorable Jacobs an increased time sheet now for or time sheet rather for, for, for trap. From that 350,000 now, we've increased it to 1 million uh, to make it responsive to some of the needs of the clients on the ground because some of them wanted funding that was more than what we were providing. And now it speaks to the issue of how do we, together with the department, design these chat programs to ensure that they are responsive to the challenges that the, the, the SMMEs are facing on the ground. And that needs basically an understanding of the value chain. Through your value chain analysis, you are able to identify the binding constraints. And then in, in your response, then the intervention should seek to address those binding constraints that will have identified in the value chain analysis. So that's the approach that uh, we want to use going forward so that our interventions are sharp and pointed and they respond to the real problems that our people are facing. We will also address the question of automation. We're going to be rolling it out full scale this year to make it easy for the clients actually, and also give full control of the application process to the clients. Um, and also, we we, we, we going to be working closely with CEDA to ensure that the training and development issue is very, very critical. I think the Youth Challenge Fund was an eye-opener. There is a need for increased training of the youth on basic business management. If a person cannot even know when you are being asked to upload your CIPC document, which is a company registration document, because you are not SASA, we don't provide grants, we don't just need your ID. We are providing funding to SMEs. There must be some form of registration that you, you have to upload into the system. And those are the gaps that were identified through this Youth Challenge Fund. Hence, it took longer to assist, because now you must go back and assist this person to put together this information and upload it. But we're working closely with FIDA to, to, to address that problem. And what we've done, uh, uh, because Jay, one of the issues that I have mentioned in my presentation is that the question of capacity. We can drive these short-term interventions vigorously. But when I come to this portfolio committee, the committee says, okay, now let's go back to APP. Did you achieve the targets that we tabled last year? As we run to implement these short-term interventions, I also need to find a balance of ensuring that we deliver on our APP. So one of the things that we need to do is that there must be program management, and we're going to put together capacity for what we call government programs, so that there's some bodies responsible to ensure that we don't lose traction on our APPs, but we also deliver on these what we call needed interventions that I've mentioned earlier on, starting with the, with the, the, the COVID intervention, the riots intervention, and now the, the, the what we call the floods that we've seen in the, in the past few weeks. So there is that balance that we need to, to find as we do this work. Um, how are we going to improve microfinance? Yes, I think the chair spoke to that. The, 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 one of the key deliverables, Honorable Jacobs and uh, Honorable Kruger, that we want to drive this year is the introduction of more Black-owned intermediaries in the microfinance space. I think we'll report when we table quarter four here to this committee that we've seen a massive improvement 
in new intermediaries who are funding SMMEs now. These are your intermediaries who finance the people who've got purchase orders from government and municipalities or the corporates, um, people who have got tenders to do construction of schools and clinics and the works. So those ones, we've seen a, a, a real improvement, but we're still struggling with the, with the, with the microfinance one but we will be actually focusing in that area. One of the issues that we have done, we started doing, is to build the capacity of the microfinance division within CIFA. Because for the past two years, that division has not been capacitated. And we're saying, let's start by actually cleaning our own house. And then as we do that, let's start now building these new intermediaries in the microfinance. And one of the key issues, and one of the crew guys correct, microfinance is very expensive. These two other uh, major micro lenders uh, uh, that we're working with, uh, 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 they rely in the main from on donor funding. And we say, as government, we've got two options. As we introduce these new micro lenders, it's either we provide and give them subsidies to finance the operations, or we increase fund, what we call a, a raising of funds from the donors like we do with the, with the like it's done by SEF, to ensure that they at least cover their, their basic operating costs. Otherwise, the profitability levels are almost zero there. You can't sustain a microfinance entity without that support. So those are the issues that we say this year. We want to focus on that. As we build those micro lenders, let us be clear that the cost of executing those small loans are quite high, and somebody needs to pay for that. And that is either government or the donor funders. Um, the, the, the performance, I think, Chair, the issues that really uh, uh, relate to, to, to donor, rather to performance uh, on the numbers, we will come back in quarter four and table those. And also, as members look at some of our numbers, they must remember that in our plan for this year, we are not budgeting for COVID relief. One, we are not budgeting for riots in KZN, we are not budgeting for floods. So some of our numbers in the past year or two, they were increased by these short-term interventions. Uh, so now we're going to plan for the normal business of CIFA. Yes, some of these actually events will come now and again, and we'll work with the department and the treasury and see how do we finance those uh, short-term what we call end, urgent interventions of government. So if you look at our target, it's, they're not flat as such. But we say, now, as we do our base here, take out those uh, programs that are not going to be there going forward. Chair, so, I hope we've covered the majority of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. <clears throat> DG, is there anything which you would like to say? Uh, thank you, Chair, and to the honorable members. Just two quick points that I thought maybe I should just respond to. I think the CEO has covered the issue of TREP, but just to also throw in the numbers there, uh, TREP, uh, if members remember well, it was approved by cabinet in March 2020, immediately just before COVID. And we had to utilize TREP to respond to COVID and assist uh, spaza shops and all these uh, small businesses or micro businesses that were affected uh, by 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 the lockdown. So far, CIFA has supported a, over eight thousand businesses. Sida has supported over twenty six thousand nine hundred and seventy two. Yeah, it's twenty six thousand nine hundred and seventy two. Uh, businesses through this trap intervention. And this intervention is not just about giving people money, but we have businesses now that are registered, businesses that have been supported through a non-financial support, being taught how to do bookkeeping, of which is something that is very critical if you are going to be able to access financial support in the future. So there is something that really we believe TREP has made an impact in supporting because this was the first time that government has come up with a scheme that is dedicated towards supporting enterprises that are based in township and rural areas. The other critical point uh, that I think we, government has to address, by government I'm referring to treasury in particular, the issue of DFIs, 
we always push them to go to these risky areas. We ask them uh, to go to areas where really there is not much uh, support. But on the other hand, Treasury will come and say your impairment ratio is too high. Um, you know, this uh, entity, we cannot give you more money because uh, you are unable to recover the money. We are, on the other hand, we are pushing them to go to these risky areas, but on the other hand, we expect them, you know, to get all the money back. So there is a, a need, you know, when it comes to DFIs on how we capitalize them in the first place. But secondly, what are the targets that we give them? Do we give them developmental targets or we give them uh, financial targets? We expect them to realize profit because if uh, DFI, we expect a DFI to perform like a commercial bank, but we expect them to do things that commercial banks cannot do, then we are really not uh, doing what we are supposed to do. So there are discussions, Chair, that we are starting with National Treasury, trying to, because the, even the new entity, we need to really capitalize it. And Treasury has to come on board and make sure that they give them decent funding for them to be able to go to these uh, difficult areas to address the gap in the market. Because those businesses uh, that are able to get money from commercial banks, really, they really don't come you know, to DFIs. It's mostly those that are struggling with the commercial banks that come to DFIs. So there is really a need from government side to be very clear in terms of the mandate that we give to, to, to our DFIs. Do we tell them to talk to issues around uh, balancing uh, special development issues? Uh, is it the employment targets that we are also pushing them to do? Or, you know, we just want them to pay back the money. We don't care whether, you know, the money assisted these enterprises to create jobs in these uh, difficult uh, times. So the, those are the things uh, that we are really starting serious discussions with Treasury and saying for the new entity, we need to start on a clean slate. We know that uh, CIFA, for example, they have not been getting a lot of money from Treasury. They get, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Chair, it's around the 300 million or so just to cover operational costs. They do get a shareholder loan from IDC but also the money that uh, came through TRAP is the money that CIDA, CIFA uh, has been utilizing or it's, it's money that has made a difference in terms of the balance sheet that they have. So there is really a serious need and I think the, the, the committee can also assist us in pushing uh, that argument because we have to prepare you know, for the establishment of a new entity. Chair, I thought that those are just a few comments that I will make and uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Honorable Kruger. Are you happy? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm 100% happy. Thank you. I'm also happy because I heard them answering your, your concern, which is also my concern, the issue of ratings. Uh, DG, we really appreciate and the, the, the chairperson, the presentation and the responses. Uh, I saw your sort analysis. You are honest where you have flagged the, the weaknesses as well as the opportunities which will help us. I think what the DG was saying is part of it. Uh, indeed, the issue of resources is a, it's a worrying factor. As the Portfolio Committee jointly, I believe, will pressurize and request the Treasurer that CIFA uh, be given a, a sufficient amount which will help them to assist our people on the ground. I'm happy about the, the response. Now I'm asking honorable members to adopt the recommendation, to, uh, to approve the recommendation of CIFA. Honorable members, are you yeah. still there? Yes, yes, Honorable uh, Jacobs, I move for the <laughs> approval of this um, uh, CIFA presentation for so annual plan. Thank you. Any seconder? Honorable members, it's because of load shading. Honorable me, are you still on board? Honorable April. Uh, 
Yeah, Honorable April is uh, there's a lot shading here. Yeah. And next is Black Honor, and uh, I think Jefferson. even Honorable, even Honorable yes, I said to second. Thank you, Honorable Lorraine Levengo. The the presentation has been approved by the portfolio committee. Um, can we go back to our agenda, Rakin? Madam Chair, just before uh, Brocking uh, go through to the agenda, I think um, we must just note again um, or note it that the um, minister no, and the deputy no. minister is not there. Today. No, I'm not agreeing with you, uh, Honorable Kruger. We can't come up with other issues which are not related to the agenda. We have adopted this program a, a committee yesterday together, and they have clarified the issue of uh, 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 of the presentation in consultation with the department. The DG is here as an accounting officer. So can't note, I don't agree with that one. So the, the 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 report has been approved. We need to approve it. Uh, it's legally to do that. The next item on our agenda is uh, consideration and adoption of committee minutes of the 1st of April. Take us through, after all, we have seen those minutes for a long time. Can you take us through, Brakin? Thank you, Chairperson. These are the minutes that has been deferred yesterday because uh, uh, the the meeting of the first of April was being uh, chaired or administered by the acting Chairperson Honorable Jacob. So yesterday, by the time we we came to the consideration of them. He was out of the platform being uh, due to load shading. So I should think we will consider them uh, while uh, you are administering Chaperson, but he is the one who was administering that meeting of the 1st of April. Thank you. Proceed with page one. Page two. Any correction, honorable members? If none, let's move. Move. I said I move for the adoption of the minutes. <laughs> there is a mover on the adoption of the minutes. Which is Honorable Lorraine. Any second? Thank you, Honorable Jacobs, because you are the one who was riding the ship. The minutes are duly adopted. Next item, Rakin. The next item, Chairperson. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, closing remarks. Uh, thank you, honorable members. Thank you, Chairperson of CIFA and your team. Thank you, D. Mm -hmm. Chair, we lost you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, honorable members, thank you, uh, Chairperson of of the Board of CIFA, as well as you um, as well as the the the, um, the DG and his team. I appreciate the um, the deliberation on this matter. 
will be waiting for the department to come and present theirs. And they, um, I will be allowing members to compare whatever they want to compare because here we are trying to work harmoniously with the department. Yes, we are to raise our concerns, but we must not uh, make it difficult for them or for ourselves. We must, we must raise those concerns and uh, deal with them. DG Mpawa Longo Nigazawa Law as portfolio committee. We will appreciate if you, the department can come up with a date urgently. As long as it will be within the, the, the time frame, what do we want? We want to have time to check that particular APP so that we approved it before the date of the budget vote so that even members can prepare themselves to go and deliberate on that particular budget vote. So that's the the message we're sending to the department. But with our agency, thank you so much for honoring uh, this uh, portfolio committee and we wish you well in this coming financial year. The meeting stand agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Greetings and thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. We're talking, Mr. Polis. Recording stopped. Breaking. Hello. Wait, did I consent? Oh, CEO, Gasifa, I'm not sure, but he realizes, but I got these figures from their documents. And even the one that I picked up here, here board chairperson, it's on the annual performance plan, the corporate annual performance plan um, of, the, of the 